esports. We know them. He's got them all! He got the whole King Caboodle! We love them. We can't get enough of them. He's tapped in flame, he's got a big What in God's name is that from Sturx? Unbelievable! The rise of esports in the 21st century has been one of the greatest forms of alternative entertainment for many people. Nowadays, gamers have an established industry allowing us to watch, compete, or commentate in a professional capacity. However, underneath all the newfound glitz, glamour, and excitement, a number of unspoken issues lay within the industry. We're going to be looking back at the history of four unique esport categories, the reason for their decline, and why this is a problem for the entire scene. Ah, Arena FPS, the OG shooter and first choice for many gamers in the late 90s and early 2000s. What went wrong with the genre? Why did it die out? Well, just like all the other games we'll be talking about in this video, there isn't one sole reason for the decline of Arena FPS. Let's back up to 1996, the year of Quake. I often refer to Quake as Patient Zero because 90% of the shooters on the market today can be traced back to the game in some way, shape or form. Quake sparked the trend of bring your own computer LAN events. These gatherings lay the groundwork which helped introduce eSport culture to the family home, long before modern gaming PCs were even the norm. To understand what went wrong with the genre, one must know the defining characteristics of an arena FPS. Arena FPSs are often referred to as movement shooters because they endorse an array of mentally demanding navigation mechanics that players need to master if they wish to succeed. Bunny hopping paired with air strafing alongside rocket jumping are two movement aspects that cannot be ignored. To enjoy the game, even at an amateur level, players need to be more than comfortable executing these moves within matches. I remember my early days sitting in an offline server practicing rocket jumps for hours on end. An additional requirement for casual enjoyment of Quake is to also learn all the different styles of aim for each respective weapon. In most first person shooters, players can get away with learning only one style of aim, but in Quake, you need to know the big three, that being hit scan, projectile, and tracking. The high barriers of entry to Arena FPS make it a hard sell for newer players. Why would any kid want to spend 200 plus hours learning how to rocket jump when they could download Call of Duty and start having fun in half the amount of time? A further complication also stems from the player base divide across three specific formats. VQL, PQL and Quake Champions. This now brings us to the short-lived revival attempt of the genre. Introducing James Too Good Harding, a former Quake 4 Pro turned Dota 2 commentator. During the 2016 Shanghai Major, Too Good was fired for making crude jokes about Chinese censorship. After his stint at Valve, he went on and founded the Good Studio and began promoting a brand new arena FPS. The community was more than excited and eager for the game's release. Too Good, alongside his team of developers, poured their heart and soul into the game, hoping for it to achieve commercial success and resuscitate the long-forgotten genre of arena FPS. As an audience, we patiently waited. We were excited. The early footage looked incredible, and people couldn't wait to play. On the 4th of September 2020, after a very long and anticipated wait, Diabolical finally shipped to the public. And people complained. SPX, check one, two. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The VQL players said it was too much like PQL. The PQL players said it was too much like VQL. Some of the Quake Champions players didn't like the art style. 
The list of complaints vigorously continued. Whilst there were some things that the devs missed the mark on, the community was neither forgiving or patient enough with the good studio's intentions. After about two weeks, the player numbers intensely dropped and everyone went back to their own familiar communities. As of May 2023, almost nobody is playing Diabolical. The devs are no longer working on the game, and unfortunately, this can be concluded as the final nail in the coffin for the arena FPS genre. Next up, we've got my personal favourite, the action-packed, multi-layered world of class-based shooters. Let's go back a few years and examine how one of the best subgenres of FPS came to be. The first online multiplayer class-based shooter was a mod for the 1996 game Quake World, called Quake Team Fortress. It was developed by Robin Walker, an Australian who attended RMIT University. After some collected interest for the mod from Valve, Walker went on to work alongside the company and assisted the development of the first standalone class-based shooter titled Team Fortress Classic that ran on the highly appraised Source engine. After the 1999 release of TFC, the next eight years were relatively quiet for class-based shooters. Team Fortress Classic was successful, but it didn't get any of the casual Quake plays to switch over en masse. However, when 2007 rolled around, everything changed. Team Fortress 2, the game that truly defined the genre. Released as part of the Orange Box, it saw instant success. It was, and still is, extremely popular to this day. Soon we'll be coming up to 20 years of TF2, and the game still manages to draw in over 50,000 active players every 24 hours. Class-based shooters were one of the greatest offspring from the arena FPS genre. They kept many of the movement mechanics like strafing and rocket jumping, but refined the need to master all of the aim styles. If players were only good at aiming hitscan weapons like shotguns or sniper rifles, they could now focus on learning one or two classes instead of needing to master the big three seen in Quake. This proved to be extremely beneficial to the popularity of Team Fortress 2. New players were no longer overwhelmed with grinding meticulous mechanics in their first games. They could just hop in and have fun straight away. But for those wishing to play the game at a higher level, the skill ceiling was still present and visible. The greater levels of accessibility amalgamated with an observable degree of an attainable expertise brewed a perfect recipe for the success of Team Fortress 2. So again, that begs the question, what went wrong with class-based shooters? The story of Team Fortress 2 is nothing short of heartbreaking. Competitive 6v6 was adored by hundreds, but always operated on community servers with modified rule sets. It was a game within a game. For a long time, the ESEA League in North America had its own branch for 6v6, which rivaled the Counter-Strike Source competitions in player numbers in the late 2000s. It was never fully supported or officially recognised by Valve. For years, the community tried to reach out to see if they would be willing to throw some money at tournaments and promote the game. Representatives from the competitive community practically begged Valve to take notice of the game's eSport potential. Eventually, they did implement an in-house matchmaking for the 6v6 format, but the update was terribly half-baked, and at that point, it was too little, too late. The events that transpired around competitive TF2 might have been soul-crushing for fans, but the story for class-based shooters was far from over, as something big lay on the horizon. In 2016, Blizzard delivered their take on the hero FPS. That's right, Overwatch, the game that generated monolithic levels of hype. Overwatch was like a breath of fresh air for the genre. Over 9.6 million people played the game during the beta. The excitement didn't stop there. Shortly after the game's release, Blizzard announced the Overwatch League. 
This was a world first introduction of an official and dedicated professional circuit, globally uniting the finest players and teams, accompanied by the establishment of franchised organizations providing lucrative contracts and salaries. This announcement was bigger than just Overwatch or class-based shooters. It marked a major turning point for the esports industry and will forever be known as an iconic milestone for competitive gaming enthusiasts. So, with all these positive factors present in the early years of Overwatch, you might be starting to ponder the answer to the main topic at hand. What went wrong? Overwatch's fall from grace isn't quite like other games or genres, since it's far from being what most would categorize as a dead game. The game's allure has, however, experienced a substantial decline over an extended period. This can be mainly credited to a series of regrettable missteps made by Blizzard. 2019. One year on from the inaugural season of Overwatch League, the dive meta started to become dry and repetitive. Spectators were beginning to take notice. The developers set out to aid the problem with the implementation of a new support hero, Brigida. This only made matters worse as teams were able to figure out a new comp called GOATS, which consisted of three tanks, three support, and no DPS. This resulted in matches more uneventful than the previous dive meta. Since damage heroes weren't being played, the visually exciting aspects of Overwatch were no longer being shown, which made the spectating experience unbearably lackluster. Blizzard's incompetency continued for the next two years. Overwatch was confronted with sizable drops in viewership and player numbers. Eventually, fans of Overwatch were hit with an unexpected announcement from Blizzard. This left fans perplexed, since many developers of other major esport titles take almost a decade before they even consider releasing a sequel to a major IP. There were two main objectives behind Overwatch 2. The first, to fix problems with the old meta by providing an assortment of balances to existing heroes while simultaneously adopting a faster 5v5 format by removing one tank slot. The second was to create a brand new cooperative player vs enemy mode to offer gameplay variety outside of the competitive matchmaking experience. Amongst both of Blizzard's goals, the PvE mode was the main justification and defining factor behind the two in Overwatch 2. With anticipation building, fans eagerly awaited the game's release. The mounting hype reached an accelerating crescendo. This was Blizzard's chance to resurrect Overwatch back to its Tier 1 esports status. They had to get this right, otherwise everything would be lost. October 2022. Overwatch 2 arrives without the PvE mode. The release was met with significant backlash. People were pissed, but despite these criticisms, the game still managed to garner some initial excitement from fans. Sadly, initial was the key word there. Fast forwarding to today, at the time of making this video, Blizzard have announced that the long awaited PvE mode for Overwatch 2 has been cancelled. Now, you might be thinking that PvE doesn't have anything to do with the Overwatch League. That is partially true. As mentioned before, the PvE mode was the main reason why Overwatch 2 could be justified as a sequel. Now, it's simply a glorified update. Not only is this a complete and utter PR clusterfuck for Blizzard, but it's bad for the entire game since players won't be coming back to check out the cool new thing that everyone was excited for. So where does this leave class-based shooters? Well, the combination of Blizzard's Overwatch calamity and Valve's neglect for TF2 has left the entire genre in a steady decline within the esports industry. While the Overwatch League is still operating, it's more than safe to say that the game is no longer breaking Tier 1 or even Tier 2 esports status. The future of class-based shooters is riding entirely on Blizzard's ability to pull Overwatch back into the spotlight. Here we have the fighting game community. Oh my god! That's gonna be it! Kenya! Second seven champion! Oh, 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 oh,
Fighting games are arguably one of the oldest forms of esports, with local tournaments dating back to arcade gatherings in the 90s. While they still manage to carry a cult-like following, the level of popularity is nothing compared to the genres they rivaled in their heyday. Once again, to find out some of the issues plaguing the genre, we're going to have to take a quick dive back to the early 90s. <laughs> Hypex in the United Kingdom and Sprint in the United States were the first companies to commercially offer dial-up internet in 1992. Although this occurred at a similar time to the early Street Fighter arcade tournaments, no one back then could predict that it would mark one of the greatest threats to the genre. Skipping ahead to 2010, just about every high-income country's household had access to ADSL 2 Plus, or better yet, some form of a fiber optic network. In my opinion, the consumer transition from arcade machines to household consoles with internet access created more harm than good for fighting games. But why would this larger player access be a bad thing? Well, you see, fighting games don't work as well in online settings compared to other esports. In most multiplayer games, players will connect to a dedicated host server for that respective region. This works perfectly fine as long as everyone playing on the server is local to that area and has a stable internet connection. This is not the case with fighting games, as many use a delay-based peer-to-peer connection that performs terribly. This results in some tremendously laggy 1v1s, which is less than ideal for a competitive game where the succeeding outcome is determined by lightning-fast, frame-perfect inputs from the players. Because of these issues, hosting fighting game tournaments online simply wasn't viable. The only way to compete was at LAN events like the world-famous EVO. Only recently have developers started to adopt the rollback netcode, which basically anticipates what each player will do next. The game will predict the inputs from the players, and the actions will be executed over the connection to reduce the delay. Unfortunately, by the time developers adopted this function, other genres already had over a decade's worth of stable online competitions and exceeded the popularity of fighting games. It's much more than the lag. Like the arena FPS genre, fighting games are symptomatic with the large but even more exaggerated divide of the player base. Within the FGC are two distinct subgenres: traditional and stage. Traditional fighters like Street Fighter, Tekken and Mortal Kombat are characterized by their ground-based movement mechanics, which employ a number of directional blocking, attacking and chaining moves, paired with an extensive list of combos needed to be memorized for each individual character. Stage fighters like Smash are defined by the knockback percentage meter played on maps featuring differently elevated platforms that the players can jump on. Now, here's the real problem. Within both subgenres are various titles and formats that people have grown loyal to over the years. Traditional fighters have Street Fighter, Tekken, Mortal Kombat, Dragon Ball Z, Marvel vs. Capcom, Guilty Gear, and with Riot's recently announced fighting game, Project L, the oversaturation of games is only going to get worse. The case for stage fighters is a little more complicated. At the moment, the three most played stage fighters are Smash Ultimate, Smash Melee, and Brawlhalla. Smash has always been the largest, but the relationship between Nintendo and the competitive community is even worse than that of Valve and TF2. If you thought the neglect from Valve was bad, Nintendo takes it a step further. They have a track record of sending out multiple cease and desists to tournament organizers. However, this corporate bullying from the multi-billion dollar Japanese giant actually provoked inspiration for some smaller studios to develop their own stage fighters. Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl and Multiversus were both created with the goal of rivaling Smash Bros and taking the power out of Nintendo's hands. Sadly, both games ended up suffering the same fate as Diabotical did in the arena FPS genre. After only a few weeks of release, players grew tired and impatient and eventually went back to their own niche communities. This wasn't just one, but two failed attempts to try and migrate the competitive stage fighter scene. The fighting game community has endured oversaturation to the highest degree. There are quite simply 
Too many titles spreading a diminishing player base thin. Okay, let's quickly talk about RTS and more importantly, StarCraft. Now, I originally wasn't going to include this section in the video because my knowledge of anything related to real-time strategy starts and finishes with me playing Tau Empire very poorly in Dawn of War Soulstorm. But given the astronomical popularity that was inherent to StarCraft, it didn't feel right by me to upload this video without at least attempting to explain the title's stagnation. The competitive fighting game scene may be debatably older, but thanks to One Nation, the fame that StarCraft had in the early 2000s was incomparable. When StarCraft came out in 1998, it encapsulated the entire country of South Korea. Once it hit the market, PC bums across the nation quickly transitioned from email checking internet surfing centers to competitive gaming hotspots. The esports scene in Korea was decades ahead of any Western country. They were the first to embrace sponsored players, gaming houses, and have matches broadcast on live television. Some of my best childhood friends were Korean, and I remember them telling me how they had family over there that would watch StarCraft on TV just like we did with regular sports. An idea completely foreign, yet incredibly fascinating to me in 2007. Looking back at the sheer scale of the game, it was hard to imagine at the time that something so big could fall out of the public eye so easily. My best guess and safe assumption for the decline of StarCraft derives from one of the same factors that affected Quake. Now again, I don't have the greatest understanding of StarCraft's intricacies, but what I do know is that the game is unforgivingly tough. My hypothesis is that StarCraft was surpassed by the rise of MOBAs for reasons of accessibility. StarCraft's competitive format is played in aggressive one-on-ones. Mistakes can be blamed only on yourself. Smaller errors also have greater consequences and psychological impact. Performing up to 400 actions per minute whilst precisely calculating resources and controlling multiple units in a build seems extremely draining. Comparing this to the gameplay of MOBAs, where most of the operation is attended to a single hero on teams of five. At face value, this appears to be less intimidating and more encouraging for first timers. If we go back and observe the progression from arena FPS to class-based shooters, a pattern starts to emerge. First in the timeline was Quake. Competitively played in the dual format, players would use their movement mechanics to gather weapon, health and armor pickups around the map and frag their opponents with guns, requiring different styles of aim. Keeping track and correctly timing when and where the pickups would spawn was essential to maintaining the upper hand on your opponents. Then Team Fortress showed up, with similar movement mechanics like rocket jumping and air strafing, but this time the competitive format being played on teams of six, with most plays locked to one class, meaning that they already spawn with their weapons and usually only aim in the style of either hit scan or projectile. Since the objective of sixes was based on control points rather than deathmatch, player deaths didn't directly affect the score. The presence of resupply cabinets and a medic on the team also meant less emphasis on picking up ammo and health packs. After TF2, it was Overwatch. In Overwatch, players have unlimited ammo and two support heroes, making health packs even more redundant. Additionally, the movement mechanics have been further simplified for the purpose of player accessibility. Take rocket jumping for example. Rocket jumping in Quake and TF2 requires players to precisely flick their mouse to the side or bottom corner of the screen. Press mouse 1 and spacebar at the exact time and quickly look back in the direction of travel. To do the same thing in Overwatch, you press shift and that's pretty much it. Now, before you go off at me in the comments, I'm not saying that MOBAs or class-based shooters like Overwatch are easy by any means. There's a very good reason why I've never set foot in Dota 2 and could barely climb to plat DPS in Overwatch. Unique skill sets and characteristics attached to all these titles can make them just as challenging as each other. I'm simply pointing out that the overwhelming complexities in StarCraft caused a lack of modern interest for people outside of the game's bubble. Old school titles also have aging audiences populated with seasoned veterans. Any occasional newcomers to the scene have a hard time finding opponents of the same skill to play against and easily get discouraged. 
Starcraft was just one of the many victims that didn't survive the trend of mechanical simplification in video games. As time went on, the free-to-play model became standard. Studios fine-tuned their projects to attract and retain less experienced players and eventually profit through microtransactions. That's just my theory at least. If you think I've got anything wrong, then let me know. And here we are, we've finally arrived. After unpacking the historic events and various aspects affecting fighting games, arena FPS, class-based shooters, and RTS, I can begin to voice my own personal concerns. The eSport industry is currently witnessing a prevailing dominance of MOBAs and tactical shooters, steadily progressing towards an increasingly concentrated landscape reminiscent of a duopoly. While fans solely devoted to games like League of Legends, Dota 2, CSGO and Valorant may not have immediate concerns, the gradual decline of alternative titles is highly alarming to me. It would be disheartening to witness a future where tactical shooters and MOBAs reign as the only viable career path for aspiring professionals. Furthermore, envisioning an industry where spectators are limited to just two options for their weekend entertainment is a daunting prospect. Although my concerns may appear dramatic, when viewed from this perspective, the clarity of the situation becomes undeniable. Fewer players means less viewers. Less viewers means less sponsorship, and less sponsorship means less money. If there isn't enough financial incentive to play, pros either retire or migrate to other titles. This is particularly problematic for the smaller genres we've spoken about. Due to the almost virtuosic nature of these games, the difficult learning curve creates little incentive for new players to take that leap of faith and try something new. The emerging generation of gamers want to have fun straight away. The practice of studying intricate gameplay mechanics for hours on end is now a thing of the past. The decline of alternative esport genres can be largely attributed to the convergence of gamers' insatiable appetite for instant gratification and the ill-advised choices made by disconnected developers. Addressing this challenge won't be a simple task, and regrettably, I don't have any specific proposals. All I can say is that the rich variety of games encompassing the esports landscape remains one of the most cherished attributes of the industry to many people. It is my sincere hope that this video will foster a collective awareness of these issues, urging us to remain vigilant and ensure the preservation of diverse esports genres from any potential extinction. Whether you're a developer, pro gamer, caster, analyst or casual spectator of the scene, one thing we can all agree on is that we love seeing our favourite games succeed up on the big stage. Thank you.